the hunter-warrior avoids the last temptation. She knows that when her real world separates itself from the immediate world, it is no longer reality. She ever watches for this treachery of the real that turns itself into just one more illusory absolute. So she never allows herself to forget that having seen all, she is still nothing. She is careful to remember that she dies just like all who have never awakened. This is why she treads the endless way, willingly sharing the doom of all without pretension. So when we look at our traditions, especially our mystical traditions, most of them actually struggle quite a bit with the relationship between contemplation or a deep meditative experience and action in the world. The Christian tradition certainly has struggled with that because for a long time, for many, many centuries, we were told that the goal of spiritual life was to essentially check out and get absorbed into the reality of God, reality that is beyond name and etc. And in my experience, and I think that I learned this primarily through my work with homeless youth, not only action can be related to contemplation, action can become contemplation. And the way that I discovered it was through my service that I did with homeless youth on the streets of uh, New York City. I learned contemplative prayer uh, in different monasteries, but I didn't really discover what prayer is until I had this one specific experience with homeless youth. And that was initially when my friend and I co-founded the Reciprocity Foundation, which spent many, many years working with homeless youth and is still very much alive in New York City. Initially, I thought that my role there was to essentially utilize whatever therapeutic techniques I learned and to show up and help people fix their lives. And after a couple of years or so, I discovered that that was actually not working and that that was maybe appropriate or even helpful in some cases, but that wasn't necessarily my vocation. My vocation was quite different. It was about showing up for each person who came to our center in the same way that I would show up for prayer. And how do I show up for prayer? I show up for prayer acknowledging what is alive in me at this particular moment. I bring all of that into the presence of the divine. I name what's present and then I just sit there in this state of receptivity and openness, waiting, trusting that God can somehow descend into my life and take everything that I'm bringing, which is mostly my difficulties, my heartbreaks, uh, and somehow transfigure that into something that could become my gift to the world. And so this is, I think, in a Christian tradition, what contemplative prayer is. Uh, it's learning how to be in a state of receptivity and consent. So that impulse of God that is longing to be present in our lives can be freed and can begin to work in us. So we have to say yes to it and then through us also work in the world. And so the experience that I had with homeless youth when I started showing up in that way things changed for me. And so every morning I would prepare, I would practice, and then I would show up for every person who came for help to our center, just being there in a state of curious not knowing, putting everything that I know aside. And what that meant was that to truly show up for them in that way meant to be present to their pain without any buffers 
It meant that I had to accompany them into the depths of their pain, their abuse, their heartbreak. And I noticed when, you know, that wasn't certainly a kind of a very professional way of accompanying someone through healing. But when I would do that, I realized that, you know, I was often right there with them breaking into pieces. But when that happened, every time I realized that underneath it all, there was this something, this presence of God that would just kind of show up in our midst. And that the only thing that we had to do was to just be open to it and say yes to it. So it could begin to do the work of healing. And when that happened, it wasn't really clear who was helping whom. And so I think that for me, that's what engaged contemplation is or contemplative activism is. St. Augustine has this beautiful description where he says that in the innermost cabin of our hearts there is a sleeping Christ there. Among people be aloof. Do not engage yourself to any idea you get. Free yourself from everything chance brings to you, things that accumulate and cumber you. Set your mind in virtue to contemplation in which the God you bear in your heart shall be your steady object, the object from which your attention never wavers, unwavering contemplation of the infinite object. So the point is, in our zendo, when we sit in the zendo, we can let go really everything. But when, for example, uh, a tenzo, a cook, work in the kitchen, the, the person needs to focus on clearly see, understand what the person is doing. The person should remember something. But other thought, other miscellaneous thought, coming and going can be let go. But sometimes we uh, forget what I am doing, even though I'm doing. <laughs> I forget what I'm doing and think something else. But because of that in practice, we know how to return to what I'm doing here and now. That is concentration of what we are doing here and now. So in the case of working in the kitchen, we have to f remember what I'm doing and also the order of the working from, you know, washing the rice and cutting vegetables and uh, actually cooking. We are working in that kind of a uh, process. So we have to remember uh, where we are now in that process. So we have to think something, but rest of the miscellaneous things we can forget or let go. And that is uh, how According to Dogen, that is how our doesn't function in our daily lives. So not only in the kitchen, but all other places and all other activities we do, it's the same. We focus on what I'm really facing or doing and uh, forget about rest of the meaningless uh, thought for what we are doing here and now. So that is how our Dazen practice work in our daily lives. For example, when we, all, we walk on the street, it's important to remember the meaning of the color of the you know, traffic light. We have to pay attention and need to understand what that means. Otherwise, it's dangerous. In our daily lives, for example, in Dogen's tradition, cooking, is important practice. Humility means that more and more you're giving up your attachments to life, saying it, hanging on to things of life to make life worth living. You know, you got to make it, brother. You got to make it one way or the other. Giving all that up. The heart of the universe is love. Uh, uh, contemplative tradition. This is available for everybody. There is a third way beyond fight or flight, conservative or liberal, and it probably is a way of kneeling. Most people would just call it wisdom, which is always distinguished from mere intelligence. 
It demands a transformation of consciousness and a move beyond the dualistic win-lose mind. The gospel accepts this essentially tragic nature of human existence. It is willing to bear the contradictions that are imprinted on all of reality. It will always be a road less traveled. Let's call it unstable stability. But for some reason, it is the only real stability, because it is a truthful map of reality, and it is always the truth that sets us free. It is contact with reality that finally heals us. And contemplation, quite simply, is meeting reality in its most simple, immediate, and contradictory form. It is the resolving of those immense contradictions that characterizes the mystics, the saints, the prophets, and all those who pray. The result is always a third something. Everything is one, and so as science continues its, its search into the unknown, which makes it a kind of religion now in itself, and which deserves to sit down at the conversation with spirituality. Because in actual fact, science speaks in more mystical language now than most preachers do. We hear physicists saying that you can't have a thought without instantly affecting everything in the universe. Well, this is pushing oneness about as far as it will go. So if a thought does this, what about an action? And if an action does this, what is our responsibility for our actions if they're affecting everything in the universe? Everything in the universe at every nanosecond of time. It means that our view of reality, accountability, responsibility is turned on its head. And the Newtonian Cartesian world is completely passé from the point of view of the facts. In many ways, through our spiritual practice and through our cultivation of devotion and etc., our goal is to wake that Christ up so he can begin to live and work and love through us. And there is also a teaching attributed to St. Teresa of Avila, even though she, I think, never really said it, uh, where she said, Christ has no body but yours on this earth. No heart but yours, no hands by yours. And I love that because that is my experience of prayer, that as one of my Sufi mentors a long time ago said that the goal of spiritual life is to let God live through me as much as possible. And so to me that's what connects contemplation and action. Contemplation is about receptivity and saying yes, and action is God acting in us and through us if we consent. And then, of course, it doesn't mean that we can't be strategic in the world. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't have political commitments. It doesn't mean that, that we should just kind of sit and wait and not build organizations or get involved in movements. All of that, I think, is very much needed. But the foundation of our being needs to be that experience of letting God live through us as much as possible. I am discovering I am not the first person to explore this ultimate journey, this journey of practice and awakenment, this journey of action. I am grateful for the library of the deep. I am grateful for the mentors who have gone before. I am grateful for the small segment of the human community today choosing this path of the contemplative practitioner as they travel alongside me. I am also awakening to the paradox of my need to disidentify with this physical body as the essence of who I am. Yet while on this planet, to allow my hands to serve as the hands of the ultimate reality, my eyes as the eyes of ultimate reality, and my feet as the feet of ultimate reality. It is time for me to explore the ultimate body. Will you walk alongside me? Let's go.